Welcome to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tovel. And we, of course, have an amazing show for you today. We're going to be talking about a rebrand of a popular tracking company. We're going to be talking about ARM dropping its low-power Bluetooth IP. We've got a threat report. And we're going to ask an existential question about your smart home security. Plus, we are going to hear input from the Property Brothers. Ah! And we've got tons of news bits, such as a really cool consumer premise equipment from a French ISP. We've got new smart devices for the bedroom, some crazy glasses, a $10 smart plug, high def cameras, and so much more. Plus, I'm going to tell you what I think about the first alert one link safe and sound device that is expensive, but might be worth it for some people. And our guest this week is the CTIO of the city of Calgary. She's going to be talking about how the city created its own LoraTech sensor network and what the heck they're doing with that. And we'll have a message from our sponsor, Digicert. All of this is coming up after a message from another one of our sponsors, Afero. Looking for an IoT platform? Find out why Kenmore and D-Link picked Afero. Afero customers have experienced as much as 80% reduction in time to market, 99% fewer support calls, and a 10x higher activation rate. Plus, they can reuse 90% of their work from one project to the next. To learn more, visit Afero. That's A-F-E-R-O dot I-O. Okay, Kevin, let's get this party started. Woo-woo. With Tracker. What is happening with Tracker? Hmm, Tracker, who you may be familiar with, who makes Bluetooth tags for locating items. You put a tag maybe on a purse or a backpack or a computer, whatever. And if you leave it behind, you can use crowdsourcing technology from other Tracker users to find it. They're not doing that anymore. They're still going to support the old Tracker devices, but they have pivoted with a name change. They are now called Adero, and they have a new line of products, which is a twist on what they used to have. So I kind of find this interesting. What Adero is going to be selling, in fact, they already are, are a bunch of small Bluetooth items, such as tags, taglets, key rings, lanyards, etc. And the idea here is that you make a smart container. The container might be, again, a purse, a backpack, a duffel bag, a suitcase, whatever it might be, a briefcase. And you basically use the smaller tags to attach to all of the items that you normally carry in that smart container or that bag. And when you leave the house, if you've forgotten one of those items, it will notify you before you leave, kind of right away. So I like the idea of this. It starts at $119 for three tags and three taglets and a charger. So it's not cheap, but... Yeah. So I think there's actually a gem of a really great idea in here. And maybe it's because I'm a parent or maybe it's because I personally have such a crazy lifestyle. But if you could bring something like this in and make it washable and then also make it connect to your schedule, I think you start looking at something that could really change, like that would be worth that much money. So imagine if I could put like on my daughter's gym clothes, these taglets, and I could associate that with like Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, which are gym days, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff would be like game changing. Same thing for me. If I could stick it in, you know, my gym bag, we're pretending I go to work in this scenario. I don't. But if I could do that in, especially for things that are variable, is that the way to think about it? I don't know. Like, I like where this is going. I don't think it's 100% there yet. I mean, I know people who do forget their sunglasses, their keys, and their smartphone and their wallet, mm -hmm. which is, I'm guessing, a very common use case here. But Sure. You walk out the door typically with the same X number of items, and every once in a while you forget one of those, and this would prevent that. They do actually have a way to set up customized recurring reminders. So if you have like an event at five o'clock that you normally go to and bring certain things and you've tagged them, it'll remind you, hey, your yoga class is coming up. Your yoga mat is not in your bag right now. Don't forget it, et cetera, et cetera. So, and they're oh. part of the way there. They're part of the way there. Awesome. And this is part of a trend. I mean, in Tracker, actually, that was your favorite one out of all the, tra like there's tiles, there's... um. Oh, there's one that starts with a C and I can never remember it. There's a bunch of these out there, but you liked the tracker. Yeah, we still have them. And literally, I just used one right now, even though I have two more sitting around. We have it on the mailbox key. 
because we have a mailbox down the street that we have to go to. It's in a townhouse community. And whoever gets the mail usually wasn't putting the key back where it normally goes. So nobody could find it the next day. So we put that on there. So that way we can find it. Yes. And I think we're going to see a lot more of this tile even his de-emphasized its like individual tiles and is working much more on basically creating a Bluetooth tracking network through its partnerships with like Land Rover and their pen companies and other things. So I get it, but I am kind of like, it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, to smarten up non-smart objects so that way you know you don't leave them behind. I like that idea. I don't know if I like it enough for a $120 minimum purchase. We'll get there. Yep. That's the early adopter fee. (laughs) (laughs) We're very familiar with that. We pay that all the time. Maybe not in this case, but usually. All right. In other news, this is a little bit more, oh, deeply technical. ARM has dropped its Cordio Bluetooth IP. And ARM is the chip design firm. It is the brains of almost every single smartphone out there and has a big IoT division. They had actually created this IP around Bluetooth and narrowband cellular network technology to help you. It was extra low power. It was going to be this special, like highly optimized for low power. It was very cool. They've basically abandoned it. And my hunch is they abandoned it because it was untested. There's plenty of other Bluetooth-based stuff that's fairly low power. And I imagine that, you know, the buyers of this stuff were like, do we want to go with something untested? Not so much. So it's kind of sad because I thought it was actually a really interesting technical solution, but sometimes really interesting technical solutions, if you don't solve a huge enough problem in a big enough way, it's not worth the risk. So my hunch is that's what happened here. It's interesting just from a business perspective, they actually made four acquisitions in the last three years to help develop the Cordio products. Yeah, they did. And they had funded some of these themselves. So anyway, they laid off a bunch of people. It's, it's ish. So. Mm. All right, here is, I guess, here's a question. We got some feedback from one of our listeners when we talked about, it was a, we answered a question about the guy who has his two daughters in their condo. Oh, yeah. What should their first home basically have in it from a connected intelli- or connected device perspective? And somebody was like, Stacy and Kevin, you guys really missed the mark by not suggesting some sort of security box. So this could be like a Cujo service. Maybe it's like the- For their network. For their network. For their network. Yes. Yeah. And you know, we had an advertiser, Bitdefender. They were like, I heard about it. Just like the Bitdefender box that came on right after you answered that question. So I got to thinking about this and I'm like, I don't currently have one of those services. I'll be honest, I've tried them out, but I don't actually run one on my network all the time. And I don't feel- unprotected, but I do feel like there is more information that I could know about Mm. my network. So I'm curious your take, Kevin. Well, I don't have one either right now. I have a Google Wi-Fi mesh network connected directly to Verizon Fios, which is available in my area. So that's pretty much it, you know, and it's set up appropriately. I don't think there's anything more I can do in the Google app to add security. I have looked at some VPN services and tried them, but that causes problems because we subscribe to online television and you start having, you know, geolocation issues when you have a VPN. So I turn the VPN off. I know there are some boxes that can not sniff the traffic, but sort of monitor the traffic and see if devices are inappropriately accessing the web and so on. And those have to go behind my Wi-Fi network. And so that seems to be an issue as well, because I don't want anything behind the network because that causes other setup problems. So I think it's a good idea. I have yet to have found the right one for me. And I prefer one without a subscription. I may look at some that I can install on a Raspberry Pi. Pi Hole, that project, I think only really blocks ads and things. It's not going to give me any security. So I'm all for it. I just haven't found the right one. Fair. Yeah. And so I guess we will amend our answer to say, if you're really concerned about this, there are security services and boxes that come. I actually do check my Eero network every now and then to see if any devices are like sending more data than they should. But that's about the extent of it. So I'm not really... Yeah, I do the same. In in the Google Wi-Fi app, you can see at any time the history or real time, what devices are on network, their IPs, the MAC addresses, how much traffic they sent over time, etc. It's minimal, but at least it gives me an indication. Like if my, I don't know if... If your doorbell starts sending like 30 gigabits of traffic a day, you're going to be like, that's different. Video does eat up a bunch. So maybe I should look at that closer because that typically is one of the higher used devices. But like if my June oven is using 30 gig, then I'm like, hmm, 
That should not be. <laughs> if your doorbell's using 30 gig, I want to know how many people are coming up to your door, Kevin. <laughs> we, we take Norm for a lot of walks a couple times a day, in and out, in and out. Norm's life is good. Mm. Okay. So we'll leave it up to you to decide on that one. I'm not sold, but if you are super concerned, or if I noticed a network slowdown, I would probably splurge and get one just to see what's going on. But I, I'm not sure if it needs to be there just yet. But maybe I'm wrong, because according to Nokia... <laughs> <laughs> Excellent segue. According to Nokia, IoT bots and botnets now make up 16% of infected devices observed on just general networks in the world. So this is up significantly, according to them, from 3.5% of devices. This is their malware report that they put out this week. And basically, the big story here is, holy cow, IoT bots are infected IoT devices are now a huge portion of botnet activity. IoT bot activity represented 78% of the malware network activity that they have seen in carrier networks. That's more than double the rates from 2016 after the big turning point of Mirai. So, mm. and to put it in perspective or additional perspective, Nokia breaks out different device types, classes of devices, and Android is basically the biggest target right now. They say, they being Nokia, say Android devices are responsible for about 47.15% of observed malware infections. Windows is 35%. So right there, you've got 70, 82% are those two device classes, IoT and then the iPhone is like less than 1%. So IoT basically is the other bit here. I think that's going to change. If you think it jumped big from one year ago to now, give it one or two more years when there are billions more IoT devices out there. And what do the bots go after? The big, easy targets. And that's what IoT is becoming. Well, I think it's worth noting that these IoT devices are basically anything that's not a smartphone or a computer. And one of the challenges there is there are a lot of IoT devices out there that we don't necessarily think of as IoT devices. They might be printers or network DVRs. So while this is a real threat, it's probably less of a threat for something like your thermostat. One, because it doesn't have a lot of processing power. And two, because a good company is going to handle things like API limit calls. So it's not going to reach out and try to talk to things too often. So that's just something to think about. If you're going to pick a device that's scary, I would look to video doorbells, video cameras that are connected, and I would really make sure when you're buying those devices, buy them from reputable brands. All right. As many of you guys know, I'm planning on moving in, well, it's still like six months away, but you know, it, <laughs> I'm still thinking about all of my <laughs> devices and you can expect to hear more about this, but I love the fact that the Property Brothers, those guys on, I don't know, is it Bravo? What channel is that? What channel are they on? HGTV. Oh, that's right. Yes. That makes sense. So those guys, they actually did a panel where they talked about smart homes and selling your smart homes. So of course I read it and they didn't tell me anything new, but they did say that, look, when you have all these smart devices, they become a feature, a possible selling point in your home. So don't take them out, leave them in there. So things like your Nest thermostats or your video doorbells or even light switches, he says they can raise your home's value. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, it is an investment, as they say, number one, and it's it's a value to the new buyers, potentially. I mean, not everybody wants a smart home, but that's becoming very prevalent. The thing is, though, and I kind of realized this when I moved two years ago, if you're going to leave everything, you still have to basically factory reset everything and leave instructions for people how to set all this stuff up. And that was going to be my point because ah. holy cow, I'm in the process of figuring out what I will leave. And I realized that some of my devices are echo only, for example. And so right. if this person comes in with a Google, they're going to be like, I don't need this, which is fine. They don't have to have it or they don't have to use it, but like my echo powered faucet, you know. And then the other thing is when you're showing off the house and you mention these things, this stuff better work. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I will tell Madam A to do something or even Google to do something and nothing happens. Maybe they didn't hear me right. Or my favorite is like when I say something and Madam A thinks I said something else and provides me with a completely different answer. It so happens. Yep. It does. But if you're trying to sell someone on this stuff, it's, it's a little <laughs> less ideal. Agreed. So I guess that's all I have to say about that. You guys will hear more and I will definitely do a definitive guide to... 
I guess, my particular smart home and decommissioning it. But in the meantime, Kevin and I want to talk to you about TechMeme and the TechMeme Ride Home podcast. So Kevin and I followed TechMeme.com for years. <laughs> Since it started. Basically, yes. As journalists, it's a crucial tool. We use it to keep up to date on daily news. And they now have a daily news podcast. It comes out every weekday at 5 p.m. And we find it super helpful. It's like 15 to 20 minutes long. And it really gets you it gets you the scoop on whatever happened that day in the news. So because you guys probably like podcasts, because you're listening to us, give it a try. See what you think. You can go look for the Tech Meme Ride Home podcast on your favorite podcast app. And unsurprisingly, if you start listening to it, you're probably going to hear them talk a little bit about us too. That would be nice. That was always the goal. Get on Tech Meme. Get on Tech Meme. Not that way, Kevin. I know. Uh, okay. So let's go into some quick news rundowns. Lots of new devices. So many. Okay. Yes. Over across the pond, Free, which is a very innovative telecom and ISP, they have created a new device, a new consumer premise equipment device called the Freebox Delta. And it's worth noting this, one, because when I started covering ISPs and broadband at GigaOM, Free was just innovative as all get out, just super crazy fun. They're still doing it. So now they have this, if you sign up for their service, you get what they call the Freebox Delta. It acts as a Zigbee hub. It's got Madam A built in. It's got a really fancy speaker and it's got Sigfox connectivity, which is a proprietary low power network for things like, oh, smoke detectors and random sensors that need long battery lives. So they're putting that out there. It's also a media player, a 4K HDR multimedia box. And I'm what, kind of excited. What, it's a fancy thing. What doesn't it have? <laughs> uh, it doesn't have Z-Wave. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I mean, it's like got everything in the kitchen sink there. Yes, it really does. So it's pretty fancy. They're going to charge you 10 euros a month for this device. After four years of paying that, you can keep it forever. And the CEO of Free, he hinted at selling Freebox Delta to consumers in other countries, even if they can't subscribe to the ISP service. Hmm. So I don't know. It's kind of like Roku times a million. I don't know. It's it's interesting. Cool. Yeah, it's I mean, I have the NVIDIA Shield Android TV, which could be a smart things hub as well. There's a USB stick to add Zigbee and Z-Wave. And that's kind of a similar all in one box. There's no subscription fee, but the box itself is typically $180. It's not one of the cheaper set top boxes out there, but it is one of those that's got a whole bunch of everything in it. A whole bunch of everything. Yeah. All right, let's move on down. Smart accessory maker iDevices. Yes, I don't have any iDevice devices, but for those that do, they are now integrated with Ift. So you can use Ift this then that to create recipes for your iDevices. All iDevices are supported except for the iDevices thermostat and their customizable LED night lights. Other than that, any connected smart home iDevice product, you can work with Ift. In other iNews, iHome has launched a Madam A enabled vanity mirror and alarm clock. I, I hmm. don't know. Yeah, let's just go with hmm and move hmm. on. <laughs> well, you know, this gets into what I said a week or two ago when I was saying it's just at some point it's going to stop making sense to put microphones and speakers in every single thing. Like, I don't see why you need it in a vanity mirror, quite honestly. This is why I want, you know, just my little robot that follows me around or whatever listens and is my assistant. But I don't know. Yeah. You could Madam A, Madam A on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Yeah. Well, for $180, I will not do that for this vanity mirror because right. that's how much it is. That is how much it is. Yeah. Also, other crazy new products. Bose has created, gosh, it's another glasses out there. It's called yep. Frames. It is a new wearable. It is, these are sunglasses. And I they don't are. even know what mm -hmm. to think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They, well, they look like normal sunglasses. Actually, they look like snap spectacles with just as sunglasses. I mean, that's they're $199. You can pre-order them. There's some AR apps actually coming next year. So they're not just smart glasses. Well, there's, like to, there's mm -hmm. speakers. Yep. There's speakers. Okay. They're <laughs> microphones. They're AR. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And you can access your virtual assistants. I mean, it's kind of like her, except it's sunglasses, not the ear thing. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know. The nice thing is you won't hear, or people around you won't hear the assistant through the speakers because they're kind of 
attached into the arm of the glasses. There's no earbud or anything. So I don't think they're using like bone conduction, which would give you a little more privacy as well. But they say that it's pretty discreet. And they will run up to 3.5 hours for playback of music and 12 hours on standby. So, you know, in considering their sunglasses, which I think is a little weird, just because, (laughs) I mean, like you're inside... I don't know. I mean, I get it. You're outside, you're away from stuff, but are you even connected at that point? You're probably going to Bluetooth to the phone because there's no assistant built in, so to speak. It's going to leverage an assistant on your connected phone. Yeah. So I'm very confused. And I have prescription sunglasses, so I'm not the market. They're going to be $200 Mm -hmm. pre-order start today. They're not going to be out for a while. You know, let us know if you buy this. I'm really intrigued by this. I think it's neat. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see. So they work as a Bluetooth headset for phone calls as well. You can take calls, make calls. I mean, I don't, yeah. I'm not in the market for this. And I think we've kind of, I've kind of gotten over the whole smart glasses thing, but maybe. Sure. I mean, let's give it a, throw it out there, see what happens. Yeah. Ikea has announced a, in addition to its trad free, trad free line of products. It is a $10 smart plug to go with its lights. There's nothing much to say about that. Arlo has updated its wireless security camera. Now it has the Arlo Ultra. It is a 4K HDR wireless security camera. It has a built-in spotlight. And and it's $400. It's expensive. Well, 4K doesn't come cheap. Got to pay for all those Ks. I just, I don't know. We'll get there with 4K on all these devices over time and the prices will come down. So if somebody had to be out of the gate, because I don't think any other security cameras right now are 4K. Do you need that much definition? Well, uh, you know, for if you have cameras outside, for example, and maybe something happened to your car, like mine did, with the Nest Cam, I could tell that a car hit it. I could see my car move when it got hit. It was hard for me to exactly determine the type of vehicle. And I certainly couldn't see their license plate because zooming in at 1080p didn't cut it. So if you can get four times the pixels, then maybe there are use cases where, yeah, zooming is going to be useful. Okay. I'm not saying it's worth it. I'm just saying. Hey, speaking of Nest, did your camera go down again? (laughs) I did not get any notifications that my Nest cameras went down, but apparently a bunch of people did last week. I think it was the, oh, it was just a couple days ago. My bad. On December 3rd, Nest went down again for the third time in less than a month. This happened on the 15th of November, the 27th of November. And now on December 3rd, and no root cause has been identified, but it has been obviously fixed where everybody would know about it. What's going on with the cloud services there? Because they got to be on Google Cloud. I don't know. But if anyone has any clues, let us know. In the meantime, I do appreciate that whenever my Nest devices go offline or have trouble, I do actually get an email notification that's like, by the way, (laughs) we're not working So, you know, that's kind of a bare minimum, but it is nice. Not all of my devices do that, which is why I bring it up. And actually, I should give a shout out to downdetector.com because that is one place to search for any services that are disruptive. And actually, right now on the East and West Coast, there are some issues with Nest. I don't think it's a ton, but I see the map and it's got some yellow and orange dots on it. Uh Uh-oh. Yep. All right. Let's see. We have our Lenovo's. We have two. Each of us has a Lenovo smart display. We enjoy them. They have new features. What are they, they, Kevin? do. They do. A whole bunch of new features, in fact. They're getting cooking features, such as your cookbook can now save and retrieve recipes. So you can like save certain recipes maybe that you use on a regular basis. They have the Nest Hello Doorbell two-way talk, which I have on my Pixel 3 phone. So that way it just pops right up. The doorbell shows me who's there. That's Mm -hmm. handy because my doorbell's all the way downstairs and my display is right next to me. So that's going to be. And and when I tested this on the Pixel, it was so much faster than having to open the app after getting a notification. And by the time I did that to talk to whoever was on the front porch, they were already gone. So this is a much better way to do it. They have touch alarms in the quick settings now. The timeout to go to a dark screen is actually faster when in low light, which is good at nighttime in particular. You can even now by voice say, turn off the screen and it'll do that. So if the sensor isn't quite working at night to your satisfaction, you can say, hey, shut off the screen. And then I really like this. In fact, my wife loves this. The bigger dark screen clock face. Have you looked at this lately at night? Yes, I noticed that. And I was like, oh, yep. that's fancy. Well, then, then you have the update. And me with terrible eyesight, even with the smart display on my nightstand right next to my bed, I could not read the little clock at night. So now I can, well, almost read this one. My eyes are really bad. So 
So yeah. we'll be getting you some of those Bose sunglasses and you can have an AR clock. Yeah. Who needs good vision? Just use AR. Okay. <laughs> let's talk about your new toy. You got a Google Home Hub. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I did. Speaking of smart displays, at the last second, while the Google Home Hub was on sale for $99 direct from Google, I ordered one. It is so small, which I knew because I saw it at the launch event, but I took it out of the box as soon as it arrived. And I sent Stacy a picture of this device in the palm of my hand. And what did you think when you saw that? I said, it's so cute. <laughs> it is cute. But again, with bad eyes, I like a larger display on things. So we actually, because we have the 10 inch smart display in the bedroom, I stopped watching TV on that because we have a TV on the wall there. I was using that for YouTube TV from time to time, but it's big on a nightstand. So we swapped. I bought the home hub for the kitchen island to watch news in the morning over coffee with my wife. The actual, the, the smart display is better, the big one, the 10 inch one. So now the Google home hub is on the nightstand and you're right. It's a good fit there. I think that's an ideal size for the bed. It, it does all the same things as the Lenovo one. It just does not have a camera and that's fine. But duo calls actually work the same. I mean, I didn't know my son was going to call me, but I happened to be laying around in bed and I got a duo call on the home hub. It said, you can only do audio. I'm like, I don't care. Pick it up. So I picked it up. I explained to him that I got no camera here. He said, that's no problem. He was happy to show me his happy face. So we had a great call. The experience was fine. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a nice device, at, especially at 99. 149 gets a little pricey, I think. All right. And I think it's a good bedside table device. We'll get to that yes. in a minute. So I also have a device to talk about. I have a review unit of the First Alert One Link Safe and Sound. That is a mouthful. It's actually a device that we recommended on our gift guide for grandparents just because it has so many functions. So it is expensive. It's about $200. But this is a smoke detector, a carbon monoxide detector, and here comes the crazy part. It's a really good speaker that connects to Apple HomeKit and Amazon's Echo ecosystem. So I can talk to the speaker and I tell it to do something. I can talk to it just like I would talk to Madame A. It controls all of those devices. It also will play my music from Madame A and it will also make phone calls. So, and it sounds amazing. The only issue I have with it is because my smoke detectors, and I think most smoke detectors are set by the doorways of rooms. I kind of want this thing in the center of my room, right? As, mm -hmm. <laughs> as one big speaker. It also has a nightlight that is a multicolored LED that you can set. So I can set it, I think right now it's set to purple. So, you know, in the middle of the night or whenever it detects a low light setting, it's like, oh, we'll turn the nightlight on. So I've got this purple glowy light in my hall right now where I'm testing it out. Setting it up was a super breeze. I have Kitty smoke detectors. So it's a different brand. They have, it comes with three different connectors and a mounting bracket. So I unscrewed my mounting bracket that took all of like, I don't know, 30 seconds, pop the other mounting bracket in and use the little connector, shove the wires up and screw this sucker on. The hardest part was actually screwing it into the mounting bracket. I'm not 100% sure I got all of the things totally <laughs> connected. And I say this because this is a very heavy smoke alarm. It weighs like, I don't know, pound and a half, two pounds. It's, hmm. it's not something like, I was like, I really don't want this to fall because it is heavy. It's a decent speaker and decent speakers are heavy. It weighs 1.76 pounds. Oh, I was good. Look, check out that guess. Yes, that was a good guess. And it does have, like I said, the HomeKit compatibility. So in, it's going to have AirPlay 2 coming later on. So you can actually play your Apple Music through it if you set it up as HomeKit function, functionality. <laughs> I, I didn't do that because I didn't need to. But, you know, if you wanted to, you could actually set it up as a HomeKit device and control it from there. I tested it. It works as a traditional smoke alarm. So both it will go off and it will also set off all of your other smoke alarms if they're interconnected. Does it yeah. send you an alert on your... And it sends you an alert on your... <laughs> that phone. is handy. And the thing says your it, hallway smoke detector just went off. Right. In case you're not at home, it's, that's fantastic. Yes. Because currently none of my none of my dumb smoke alarms do that. But none of your dumb smoke alarms cost $250 either. Uh, $200. Well, it's on sale for $198 at uh, Amazon right now. It's on the sale. list price okay. is $249.99. There you go. Yeah. It's, it's also on sale at Lowe's for $199. But, gotcha. yes. but yes, it is an expensive device. And for most people, you're probably just going to be like, why don't I just buy an Echo Dot? And I would say to you, this sounds better, but it is four times the price. So right. <laughs> five times the price, actually. More microphones and more speakers. I sense the trend. 
Yes. <laughs> I still like it for anyone who doesn't want this stuff in their house, like, or doesn't want it like cluttering up things. True, true. And it does sound really amazing. Yeah. Well, so, the heaviness suggests that to me because the not, yeah, the heavier speaker typically would sound better. Not, it's not an exact statement, but it's a good general baseline. Yeah. So there's that device. If you're in the market for like ceiling mounted speakers that work with Madame A or HomeKit, this, it's not bad. It's actually good. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you do have Apple Music and you don't have one of these, there's a tie up now between Apple and Amazon that yes. you're going to be able to listen to Apple Music natively on your Echo devices. Starting December 17th. And we'll let Ooh. you know because Kevin will try it out and we'll see how that works. Vector, my little robot, may have his Madam A features by then. I bet you he can play the music. Oh, my gosh. On that little itty-bitty speaker. I know You're he can going, dance. There's there's like three <laughs> different links happening to get that one thing. Oh, man, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Now it's time for our voicemail, the Internet of Things podcast hotline, which, you guys, is sponsored by Schlage. And do not miss your chance to win a Schlage Connect Smart Deadbolt now. Zigbee certified and working with Amazon key compatibility, if you'd like, you will be able to upgrade your smart home with the safety, simplicity, and style of Schlage. You can do this because every month we pick a winner for a Schlage smart lock. To win, all you need to do is call us at 512-623-7424 and leave us a voicemail with your question and you will be entered to win this lock. And let me tell you guys, ah! We have the November winner, provided, as always, that they are not located outside of the U.S. or Canada. So let's hear it for this month's winner. Kevin, who is it? It is David. And based on his area code, I suspect he is within the U.S. He actually left us a good question in November that we didn't get to. He's looking for a smart switch, a workshop light, but he has two fluorescents and no neutral wire. And we looked and we didn't find anything. There was a product that used to be made that would work for that. But we came up empty. So at least you're not empty handed, David. You win the Schleg Smart Lock. Yay. All right. And I should note that last week we talked about putting in a smart light switch without a neutral wire. I said that the only option out there was Lutron. And a bunch of people who use Insteon were like, what bam? That is not true because Insteon actually makes a light switch that also works without a neutral wire. You will need an Insteon hub. However, you also need a Lutron Hub. So, you know, it's kind yeah. of a similar scene. Similar thing. Yeah. And now let's go to this week's question, which is from Clarissa. Hi, guys. This is Clarissa from Omaha. I had a quick question about bedroom smart tech. If you guys were not concerned about privacy in any way, which I definitely know you are, what smart tech would you be using in your bedroom? Thanks. Have a great one. Okay, Clarissa. This is a good question and one we can totally help with. So, Clarissa, let us explain it. Mm, so we, we actually probably have more devices to suggest than one would want in their bedroom. And we're keeping in mind that maybe privacy doesn't matter. And that's, that's fine. That's a personal choice. Some useful items we have in here. So we mentioned the smart displays earlier in the show. I definitely think that's a good place for a smart display is in the bedroom, as Stacey had said, because you have voice control of all of your smart home devices. You can also touch screen control them. If maybe somebody's sleeping in the room, you don't want to use voice. You can get weather information, your calendar. You can view cameras from other devices in your home. Really handy. To go along with that, you probably want some smart bulbs and or switches. We couldn't decide on any single one. There's so many options out there. So I did want to make a plug for, there are a couple lights like Philips and GE make lights that are designed for better sleeping that are true. Like, yes. That move throughout circadian rhythms or are designed Indeed. to help you with circadian. Anyway, they basically start out with bright daylight and then evolve slowly into a deeper orange as it gets towards sleepy time. And when you wake up, you can have those kind of come up like sunrise, which is kind of nice. And then we also have the Amazon Look, which Stacy, you have one. This is kind of interesting because you can use it to help get clothes selections. Yes, it is a camera where you basically put on an outfit, you take a picture using the Look camera, you're like, snap a picture and it snaps a picture. And then you put on your other outfit option. 
<laughs> then it's, it basically looks at those and says, this one's better. So this is a really kind of silly thing, but I threw it in there just in case eh. you have doubts about your wardrobe or need a friend. Amazon's hey, happy to provide my, one for you. If my wife ever divorces me with her fashion degree and goes somewhere else, I will get one of those because she dresses me basically. So Excellent. let's hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, let's let's hope. <laughs> yeah. I'll send hey, you mine I'm, if that happens. That'll be my I'm consolation. Always, I'm price. always thinking ahead. I want to be prepared, you know, you know. If I, you want to monitor your sleep, you could obviously do that through wearable devices. There's so many of those that do track sleep, such as the Fitbits and smartwatches and such. But why things actually makes a nice relatively inexpensive solution for this. You basically put a little pad under your mattress and it tracks your sleep, sleep stages, heart rate, snoring, the whole shebang. And you can get that for about $80 on sale. This price is a hundred bucks, which is not too expensive. Has a nice smartphone app as well. So you can look at the graphs and all the data if that's your thing. And then we also came up with monitoring your air in your bedroom because you want to be sleeping in clean air. And Stacy, you mentioned this before because you bought one to monitor the classroom air for your daughter's class. And it's the Aware Glow, which is kind of like a smart plug, but also with sensors to monitor different aspects of the air quality. Yes, it monitors the temperature, humidity, the carbon dioxide in the air, and also quote unquote chemicals, which are hmm. volatile organic. VOCs. Yes. Yes. So, and I didn't know until you mentioned it before the show that you can actually use that data and have the AWARE's plug actually turn on, say, a humidifier that's plugged in or a air purifier or a heater or air conditioner. Yes. You will tell the AWARE what you've plugged into it, basically. So if you plug in, in our case, we plug in an air purifier. When it sees that the air quality is degrading, it will actually proactively turn on the air purifier, which is a pretty cool feature, I think. So you just tell it what you're plugging in and then it'll use it to proactively adapt the air around you. And I think that's an awesome feature. And since we have an air purifier that nobody wants to get out of bed to flip the switch, I am going to go buy myself an Aware Glow because that is perfect for what we need. Last thing we could suggest, I mean, this is really going to town if you don't care about privacy. We've talked about it before, the $1,400 3D body scanner mirror from Naked Labs. Yes, the Naked. So you could see how fit you are or not. How fit uh, or fat. <laughs> well, I didn't want to say that, but yes, yes. Because granted, you probably wouldn't have that in your bedroom. That might be in a bathroom connected to the bedroom, but I think it's a really interesting product. I just don't think it's worth $1,400 when I can you know, take pictures or have my family just tell me I'm getting fat, but that's just me. I think it's a heinous product and I would not want it <laughs> at all in my life. I, I don't even like that it exists in the world, but Clarissa- Be Because of privacy or because you have- Because you I don't want to know. I just don't want to know. Okay. I can Save judge myself the without the aid of like an artificially intelligent mirror. <laughs> you could pay me $10 a week and I could- Make the judgments for you as well. It's no, got to be no, cheaper Kevin, than fourteen hundred. Because I like you, I think you're my friend. So I am biased. Yes, I would not want that information from you. Because at the end of it, I'd be like, "Oh yeah, screw you, Kevin. Screw." So me. much for that revenue stream. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right. So Clarissa, hopefully, out of all of these devices, oh, and I, I will throw this in. We talked about having a connected bedside table lamp, which I think is great. But also, why not connect your bedroom light switch? Because then, if those lights happen to be on, poof. You can turn them off with your voice without getting out of bed, which once I'm snug under my covers, I do not want to leave that room. So I would throw that in there and maybe a smart outlet or two to control fans or anything else you've got going on in the bedroom. So all of those really, I actually have most of them in my bedroom. So, <laughs> And I thought you cared about privacy. And I do care about privacy. I don't have any cameras in the bedroom. That's the only thing I don't have. The look is in my closet facing away unless I need it. So. Facebook portal did not make the cut. Nope. All right. Well, that is it for this segment of the show. Please stay tuned for a message from our sponsor, DigiCert, and our interview with the CITO of the City of Calgary talking about their LoRaWAN sensor network. Hey everyone, we are taking a break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is DigiCert, and I have Mike Nelson, who is VP of IoT Security, here to talk to us. Let's get this started by telling us a little bit about what DigiCert does. 
We're a certificate authority. We're the largest certificate authority globally, and our services are protecting the internet connections. And that ranges everything from SSL PLS certificates for website security to enterprise security solutions. And my areas of focus, of course, is with IoT security. And we have robust solutions using digital certificates to secure and authenticate and encrypt communication over the internet. Excellent. All right. Well, you guys recently did a survey about IoT security. What did you guys discover? Yeah, earlier this year, we conducted a survey. We reached out to over 700 engineers for IoT manufacturers. These were people on the front line dealing with IoT security in their organization. Other respondents, we actually divided them into three tiers. The top tier would be classified as organizations that have fewer IoT security incidents. They've demonstrated more of a mastery in IoT security, doing things like encryption, authentication, risk assessment. There's middle tier classification and then the bottom tier. And the bottom tier, of course, would be organizations that are really struggling to get a hold of IoT security and to put those practices in place. So were there big differences between the two? Yeah, the results were surprising. So we asked the respondents about IoT-related security incidents that they had experienced over the past two years. And the difference between the top and the bottom tier were unmistakable. Of the bottom tier organizations, every one of them reported they had experienced a security incident, something like monetary damages or loss of productivity, compared to just 32% of the top tier organizations experiencing an incident. You know, that to me, shows that the things that the top tier organizations are doing, those things like encryption and authentication, risk assessment of their devices, those things are working and they're leading those organizations to be much better off. Okay, so let's talk about those on the bottom tier. What type of damages did they experience? Yeah, I think most surprising was monetary damages. 25% of the bottom tier reported IoT security losses of at least $34 million in the last two years. And those range from monetary damages, loss of productivity, legal penalties that they're having to pay, and impact to their stock price. So where can we find out more about DigiCert and the results of this survey? Our website is www.digicert.com, and there's a link there that can take you to find more information about the survey. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and today's guest is Heather Reed Fenske, who is the CITO at the City of Calgary. Hi, Heather. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Stacey. Thanks. Awesome. First off, I should tell you, CITO means Chief Information Technology Officer, which is a title I've never heard before. Is that really common, I guess, in Calgary or in this municipal business? No, I think it was just a combination of CIO or CTO. So it <laughs> takes the best of both and put them together. I was like, or possibly just two jobs in one. Yikes. So the city of Calgary has deployed a LoRa network. And I thought this was really interesting because one, there are not a lot of city-owned LoRa networks that I'm aware of. So I wanted to talk about that. And then you guys are doing some really cool things with it. So let's just start off with your approach to this network and how this came to be. Sure. And I'd have to go back in time because in the city of Calgary, we've always had a vision around a connected city. And that started, you know, more than 15 years ago. So we've been building out communication infrastructure through our fiber optic network for the last 18 years. We really saw that as the foundation of then building upon that for a smart city or a connected city into the future. And, you know, sort of knowing what was coming in the future in terms of, you know, people, assets, devices, buildings being connected and what that would mean for a city operation of our size. We wanted to make sure we had that foundation in place. So we have used our fiber optic network as the backbone for a carrier grade network, which we built in I'm going to go back 2013, which serves all of our sort of a private network for the city of Calgary and all our operations. It supports 911 and 311 and water skater systems, et cetera. And then from there, we use some of the infrastructure that we had in place. So we have radio towers that we use for our first responders for their radio systems. And we use them to then build more of a last mile component, so a fixed wireless, which helped us to get to a few city assets like traffic controllers that we couldn't do in the past. 
And then from there, we challenged our innovation team, uh, our innovation and collaboration team that we have in information technology to go about researching what a sensor network might look like and how we could use the backbone that we already had in place to be able to do that. Awesome. It sounds like there's lots of things going over that network. We can run many different services on it. It serves 260 city facilities. You know, it basically just serves all of our city operations. And this is really important. And our philosophy has been that as a city, we need our own private network. We need that connectivity everywhere. We need it to be secure. We need it to be available for our first responders and safety, public safety situations. And so that's always been our goal and vision. So why did you choose LoRa when there are kind of some other proprietary technologies out there? There's the cellular stuff. Was it part of the being city-owned aspect? No, it was just our team really analyzed. They reviewed the LoRa technology and they really felt it had some advantages in terms of some of the security functionality, the implementation and operating costs, and some of the, I think, the real ability to have sort of that coverage performance. And they're also attracted to an open standard technology because they wanted to make sure they had flexibility and better control over the system. And so that was the technology that they decided on and started to install LoRaWAN radios on some of our radio towers. And we're able to get pretty much the whole geographic area of the city of Calgary covered. Cool. Okay. So you guys were doing Smart City before it was even cool, it sounds like. I like to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You got it, Stacey. A lot of stuff <laughs> happened in there. So let's talk about some of the newer things that you guys are doing. I was most excited, I think, because it sounded both really beautiful and also complex. This Devonian Gardens that you guys have, and you should probably tell us what that is first, and then we'll talk about what y'all have done with it. Yeah, so Devonian Gardens is a three-acre like this very peaceful refuge and it's on the top of a shopping mall. So it's one of the largest indoor gardens of its kind and it boasts more than 10,000 ground cover plants, 250 trees and, you know, a 900 square foot living wall, ponds and a children's play area. So it's really kind of this oasis that Calgarians can go to in the middle of the downtown. It's really an impressive green space, has imported exotic plants and tropical trees, and it's really been a bit of a retreat for Calgarians and for tourists, especially during, you know, sort of a long winter that we go through. So they're really precious assets that are in this gardens. It is run by the city through our Calgary Parks business unit. So the main challenge for them is creating that healthy environment for all of these planter beds and all these tropical interior plants. These tropical plants, life is hard for them in the middle of Calgary, even if it is a nice enclosed area. So it sounds like you guys built out a sensor network. And I'm curious, so the sensor network measures soil moisture, it measures light for these plants, and there's a feedback loop that's getting built. What does it look like to have to build something like that? And how do you make it economical for the city? And I think the main thing for us is because we already have the infrastructure in place Having that foundation in place, it was absolutely paramount for us being able to launch our LoRaWAN network, right? And our LoRaWAN network itself really was not that expensive because we had that foundation in place. So we spent about 45K on radios to be able to have the network. And then the cost becomes about the sensor, right? And about any software or platform tools that we're using to collect the data. So the team itself, they really are our innovation and collaboration team. So they're given license to go and try different products and different, you know, they work very closely with our local university here and some experts in the field as well to come up with some ideas. So the main sensor they were looking for was a soil monitoring sensor to measure the water content, the soil temperature, and then some of the electrical connectivity in the soil as well. And so that way they can kind of understand the irrigation performance against the requirements of the different plants. And that's where it's really helping our Devoning Guardian staff to know what they should be doing and how they should be watering the plants in that area or, and even helping them understand the light and the temperature that's required to keep some of those exotic plants healthy. So how does something like this change the job of the staff in the gardens? Are they now responsible for the sensor networks? Are they still doing, like, I'm just trying to think about once we add this type of connectivity and get more information out of things, a lot of times it changes the job descriptions of some of the people working with the stuff. And I think this is an evolving thing. I know it is in our organization, is that evolution around the use of analytics 
and, you know, really making sure that in an organization, we are training people in that area. And then I think for someone in an area like Devonian, it's, they can be much more precise about the work that they're doing now versus let's, you know, try a whole bunch of things. It can be very, very much more precise. Excellent. Okay. Well, let's move to you guys have also, in addition to hopefully making it easier and healthier for your plants, you've also done a project with noise pollution and understanding kind of the acoustic profile of your city. And I'd love to hear more about that. And what does that entail? And how much of the city does that cover? Yeah, we've just done, and most of these cases have sort of been in pilot mode. And we really, to be honest with you, wanted to try some pilots where they weren't, you know, they were a little safer. They weren't going to, you know, impact an essential service necessarily, right? So in the noise pollution, and I think there's a few cities that are looking at how they monitor noise. And I think one of the goals is really to get to what's the type of noise as well, because that can help in terms of, you know, what kind of services or operations need to respond if there is something major happening in the city. The project on the noise monitoring was a partnership with University of Calgary. So between the city of Calgary and the University of Calgary, we have a program called the Urban Alliance, where, you know, if we have city problems that we're trying to solve and we think the U of C might be able to help us, We're able to put those on the table. If the UFC has some research that they would like to conduct and they would like real-time problems or access to some of our facilities or networks, that they're able to do that too. So it becomes a partnership for some of these research projects. So this one sort of fell under that umbrella. So we worked with a robotics and sensor network group out of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at UFC. And they really collaborated to help sort of build this center to initiate this pilot. So what we did is we tried it on a, you know, we have different sites where there's festivals over the summer. And that's typically where we get complaints from citizens who live nearby about noise. And we also have the ordinances, bylaws that come into play at certain days, certain hours, etc. So they wanted to have an ability to be able to understand what the noise level was. I think in the future, again, it's about that precision for city operations, right? Do we need to send bylaw out there? If we can actually get to the place where we distinguish the type of noise it is, you know, there might be other first responders we need to be able to have on board. So they used some of the Laura Bay sensors and they were placed at a carnival or it was called Circle Carnival. I actually can't remember what, I think it was a bunch of bands or something that played at a park in September. And the sensors were programmed to compute the average noise level over a window of three minutes. And the pilot was a success. When the noise level rose above, I think it was the 85 decibels, the sensor sent a warning packet through the LoRaWAN protocol. And then this feedback was proactively provided to concert promoters to ensure, or what we would hope to do in the future, is that you can get that feedback to the concert promoters to ensure the noise restriction compliance. Oh, so th- was that happening in real time? So you would get like an alert on your phone and be like, make it softer. It was it was in the pilot. We didn't quite have the connection where we were then saying, hey, Mr. Concert Promoter or Mrs. Concert Promoter, this is what's happening right now at your festival, right? But I think that would be one of the use cases going forward, okay. right? Is that instead of having a bunch of, you know, some festival people who are sitting there with the noise monitors, we're able to send them alerts, et cetera, that say, hey, you're over the bylaw range. So noise sensors have been somewhat controversial. One, because of the idea that they're recording all the time, and that makes people kind of uncomfortable. Like, can they hear conversations? We don't know. Some can, some can't. And then the other idea, I talked to somebody in the city of Busan in Korea, and they had an interesting problem where they did noise profiles in the city and in areas that were louder than others, they published this data on their website and the citizens got upset because their property values were declining is what they said. And I thought that was really interesting. And Busan decided not to publicly publish this data anymore on the website as a result of that. But there's so many unintended consequences. So can you address, first off, privacy? Are these recording all the time? And then two, talk about maybe potential unintended consequences. Yeah, and I like your question because it's something that we think about quite a bit. And in these use cases, as I said, they're fairly contained and not in critical operations. But the whole idea of privacy and where we're heading in a world of sensors I think is something that as cities, as we are deploying these for our own operations, we have to make sure we're not, you know, privacy for our citizens is paramount and that we're not, to your point, 
know, having unintended consequences. I don't know for these ones. I don't believe for the tests that we did in this one carnival, it was to the level where you could get, you know, individual conversations. I think some of the value that we're looking for is, you know, we have common 311 noise. So being able to sort of proactively address some of those noise complaints, maybe one future use case, you know, so be able to support some of those noise bylaw violations with some of that data. I have heard about, you know, being able to let citizens know where the noisiest part of the city is. So I, I'm really glad that you shared that example because those are some of the things we really need to think about and what the impacts of that kind of data could be or the influence it could have. Okay. And do you guys in Calgary, because you've been doing this for so long, so I feel like you guys must have thought about this. Do you have a digital infrastructure plan? One of the challenges I think is municipalities start putting technology in places. They don't actually have a plan to make sure it all comes together in the end. So maybe they don't have like unified data schemes or, you know, interoperability between vendors. So that's the technical side. But then on the citizen side, they don't actually have policies about privacy or how they're going to use the data. And I'm curious if you guys have built that already. Yeah. And I would say because of the track, I think we're all on as cities, those strategies and need for some of those policies evolve right along the way. So yeah, we've had a few different strategies that work together. We have a digital strategy where we really are focused on digital services for our citizens, open data, part of that data analytics. And then we have another strategy, which is more around information management and governance, right? And how we're using our data, the privacy piece is part of that you know, sort of the processes that we go through before we have data out on our open data catalog. I think it's a challenge. And as we move forward into this world, I think we're trying to go slow and sort of learn from it. There'll be more that we need to think about and consider through some of those policies and strategies that we have. So what is your next big project for the smart city going to be? You know, we're a city that's on the foothills between the prairies and the mountains. And so planting trees in our urban canopy is really, really important for us. And it's a big goal and strategy from our city council as well. But until recently, we really didn't have a dependable way or a measurable way to confirm that the city trees were receiving the correct amounts of water at the correct intervals. So we worked with our parks department to, you know, come up with an idea to have a water flow sensor so that the city trucks already have portable GPS. They have cellular modems in there, which gives that wireless connectivity to transmit the data flow. And the idea was simple, but it was complicated as well. And so what we did is we actually have watering trucks that now have an industrial grade water flow sensor in them. And then the GIS application allows viewing of the amount of water that's being dispersed on each tree in real time. And so they can actually see from the sort of the the park staff what that overall tree watering progress per day and per truck works like. And that really helps them have that visibility to show effective tree watering, number one, also to reduce unnecessary water consumption for new trees. It actually reduced the depth of new trees due to overwatering or underwatering. And so now what they've asked is to have all of their trucks fitted for these water flow sensors to ensure that they can really use their resources, water and staff and contractors really effectively and efficiently to the point where they can ensure that their staff and their contractors are doing what they're supposed to be doing relative to the urban canopy. I feel like we've covered a lot here and I appreciate you coming on the show this week, Heather. Oh, thank you, Stacey. I really enjoyed it. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week.